going to today we're going to talk about five steps to simplify your financials and improve the profitability of your business. I appreciate your being here. This is what most people think about when they think about accounting. And if you can't see that reading in the right in the bottom, it says that we've made the financials too easy to understand. Go back and figure out some way to make it more complicated, which is really what happens because most people don't understand that accounting and finance are two different principles, but they're both part of the language of business. And it's not very often taught. You become, you become an accountant, you become a finance major, but a business owner needs to know both of those, of those um, kinds of business terms and how they interact. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm gonna show you a way to simplify your financials so you can understand how to make your company more profitable. As I said, this is our outline, accounting and finance, the workshop, no time today for Q&A, but we'll wrap it up. So this is my ski area. My name is Deb Purvin, and I went to Dartmouth and Harvard. I skied on the United States ski team as a teenager. And when I graduated from, from my master's program at Harvard, I went into banking, went to work for one of my real estate developers and uh, became a, a real estate developer in Dallas, which was great. I had almost $100, $100 million worth of property um, that I was that I had built and managed, and then the collapse of the savings and loan uh, industry occurred, and uh, I didn't go down with it. Many developers did, but I paid everybody back. And when I was finished, I was I had some money in the bank, so that I'm family and I went sailing around the world. But we got off our sailboat because I was attracted. I was lured into another real estate development, including. Uh, managing the uh, businesses and uh, buying a, I bought a ski area, a golf course in Vermont. It was in bankruptcy. So we got to rebuild that and we got to, I got to learn all of the things that you can do wrong as a business owner. Now I have a business called the Business Owners MBA and I teach business owners what I wish I had known back before I started, I own this resort. And you'll hear some of my stories. So we're going to talk about accounting and finance. Accounting is about posting transactions. Every transaction has to have an accounting posting, both a debit and a credit. You buy something, you pay cash. It is all about transactions. What has happened? It records those transactions using numbers and it records the history. Finance looks at that information and analyzes it. Takes a look at what has happened in the trends and then says what might happen in the future. And how can I use these numbers to make better decisions? That's what we're gonna focus on. I don't want you thinking you have to learn to be an accountant, but you do need to learn to interpret your numbers and to interpret what your accountant gives you. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We are going to simplify your financials. Now you probably have QuickBooks or some ERP that has a million uh, general ledger line items. And that's really because the accountant has to keep track of things. And the more line items they have, the easier it is to put it in the right line item. But this, it's impossible to figure out how to run a business when you have 50 or 100 line items. What's important? What are the drivers? What do you need to know to make good business decisions? So what I recommend is what I call the management financial statement. And that is literally 10 lines long, 10 lines long. Now we're gonna expand it a little bit, but it doesn't need to be more than that. And four of the, four of the lines are calculated for you. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. I hope that you have downloaded the worksheet. We have one page on the front page, we have the five steps and on the back page, we have uh, income statement. And I want you to walk through this with me 
and not the general numbers and names and, and accounts and GLs that I'm going to talk about uh, for everybody, but those specific to your business, those specific to your tech business that does apply to your company. So the very first thing we're going to talk about is allocating your variable and your fixed costs. Now, the first most important thing is to understand the difference between the two. Your variable costs are those costs that vary. They change with your sales. It's the people who produce the sales, not just the salespeople, but the ones providing the product. So if you're in tech and you're doing software, that's those people who are writing that, that project, that program, those are your variable cost sale people. Those are your techs. And they are, when they complete their project, then you have a, you can make a sale. Your fixed costs are the same. These are your internal people who don't talk to your clients, who provide the business and the operations for your business, like your controller. Maybe you have an HR person. Maybe you have an admin. Usually the owner salary goes in a fixed cost because you're going to run the company and you're going to pay yourself, hopefully, whether you're doing a million dollars or $20 million. Now, your, your salary may be a little different, but it's not going to change. Um, well, it's going to change from a million to 10 million, but it's not going to change every day. And it's not going to vary with your sales. You may give yourself a bonus at the end, but I'm talking about that monthly or that biweekly number that you you write down and you get into your checking account each week, month, by week. So what are your variable costs? And as I said, what I see constantly, what I see constantly is that most of these QuickBooks, most of the ERP systems have salaries all lumped together. So the first thing that I recommend that you do is you separate out the salaries. Who are variable cost salaries? Your sales commissions are variable costs. The people who are co co uh, consulting, meeting with your clients, providing a product, those are all variable costs. Your office and your officer salaries, those are fixed costs. Now, this requires some manipulation of your financial statements. Commissions are usually variable. You make a sale, you pay a commission. Only pay the commission once you've received the revenue. Not when you book the sale, when you get paid. Um, raw materials, anything with your production costs, any costs shipping, traveling, anything relating to dealing with your client. And then fixed costs, other than the office people, the office itself, your licenses, your programs, your software, your insurance, those, your insurance is going to go, is not going to change dramatically if you have a million dollar or a million and a half dollar revenue. Now, if you go from a million to 10, yeah, you'll probably have to pay a little more insurance, but those are big stair steps. These, they're not going to vary with the sales number. So you can see here from my, from my slide, this is a doctor's clinic that is one of my clients. And this is their QuickBooks number. So we have um, $860,000 in revenue and a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in net income. When we separate out the, the, management, uh, the management financial from the ERP, so the management financial is, is in the middle and the ERP is, is QuickBooks, is on the right hand side. You can see that the salaries changed dramatically. The salaries on the ERP were $456,000. When we broke them into the doctors who were providing the service and the PAs who are helping the doctors, and then we left the office salaries, the people collecting insurance, you can see it makes a dramatic difference in how you think about the management of this business. The doctors are being only paid are being paid two hundred forty four thousand, whereas the G and A, the folks doing the accounting, they're being paid two hundred and twelve. Now, obviously, you go, whoa, that doesn't sound right, and it wasn't. 
the, the doctor had two clinics and they were having problems with turnover. And that turnover, as you can see, was very expensive. That number should have been in the $100,000, not the $200,000. Doctor didn't know it because they couldn't find the information. Now, another point to make is we've changed where we've put the salaries in our management financial statement, but we haven't changed the numbers. The top line, our revenue is still the same. And our bottom line, our operating profit, that number is still the same. What we're doing is we're making sure that the numbers between those two lines, the top and the bottom, we're rearranging them so we understand what's going on in the business. The accountant just dumped it all into salaries. They don't care, but you need to understand what is driving the business and what are those variable costs? Because that's usually what business owners think of. They forget about all the fixed costs and they forget to add that to, to their bids. And then sometimes they even forget to add a profit. So what happens is that fixed cost eats into the profit and all of a sudden you're not running a very profitable business. So we want to keep track of that information. The second thing that you want to do is you want to go back and look at your rev. You want to separate out your revenue streams. Now, in the example I just showed you, we just had one revenue line. OK, the doctor's office. But we might want to separate out the revenues and match them with the cost of goods. Now, I'll show you some examples of that. So what I'm talking about, like for product sales, if you're in the product business, you might want to have materials. So you can see the materials cost this and the labor cost this and that is um, that is tested against the product sales services. A lot of times you'll have. Uh, labor, you'll have time and materials, you'll have consultants that keep track of their hours. And so you can look and make sure that those two things are matching. And sometimes when you have geographic disbursement among your businesses, you might look at what those costs are in each office. So on my golf course uh, that I developed uh, in my resort, we had we had a million two in revenue and we had gross Profits of 250,000. Sounds like we were doing pretty great, huh? Cost of goods sold about 975,000. But when you start breaking out the revenue streams, you see that um, on my management financials, the golf operations were a million three and the um, clubhouse operations. So that was my restaurant and my pro shop and the um, lessons that my pro taught and a couple of other smaller items. They were $200,000 in revenue, but $280,000 in expenses. So I was definitely not running a profitable clubhouse. Now, that's pretty par for the course. I know, bad pun. But it's part of the reason that you want to look and understand your revenue streams and match them to those cost of goods because now you can start making some decisions. Unfortunately, in the golf industry, I don't, you can't run a, you can't run a golf course without having food and beverages and a clubhouse and someone to take the money and, and, and register and, and put those, those, uh, golfers out on the tee times. So, uh, we tried to make it more profitable. We tried to find some ways to raise the revenue and decrease the expenses over time, but we paid attention to where the problem was. And that's what popped out when we broke this into a management financial. Now, in my, in my doctor's office, we also had a very dramatic, uh, we got a lot of information from looking at the, the revenue lines by payor. So which, how much was being paid by insurance and how much was being paid by the patient? And as you can see, that was not collected in the QuickBooks. So the doctor started collecting that information because it was important to be able to follow up on and, and learn that, um, Obviously, what you would expect is that insurance paid more than half of the revenue that she collected. Third thing is to redefine your marketing expenses. Now, I've talked about breaking variable and fixed. I like to pull marketing out as a separate line item. In the fixed costs, 
but it's not really fixed. And the reason for that is that when you decide you're going to increase your marketing spend or decrease your marketing spend, you want to see the changes reflected in your revenues. So if you are, if you're going to go out and have a new launch of a new product, or you're going to relaunch a product that's new and better, you're going to increase your ad spend. You want to see that in a month or two, whatever the, the timeframes are in your industry, you want to see that you have a resulting increase in sales, right? If, if you've done a big ad campaign and you've launched a new product and you spent a lot of money in marketing, you don't want to find out that that's not translating into sales. You may even put a new revenue line item to watch the sales for that one product. So what would vary with your marketing salary? Watch your marketing salaries, watch the commissions. If you want to put your commissions in marketing, a lot, most people I know put them up there in variable goods, but that's a decision you can make. Um, obviously, new marketing campaigns and any kind of advertising, I'm saying Facebook ads, a lot of people use those. But so marketing, you should, if you're going to change your marketing spend, you definitely expect to see, and you should think about what you expect to see. If we spend $50,000 more, we expect $250,000 more in sales, and we expect $50,000 more in the bottom line. We expect to see commissions go up by $100,000. Just think about what those ROIs are going to be by, by separating it out. Now, what you can see is everything that I haven't discussed all of those line items that aren't a driver in this number just gets collapsed so you're going to have your cost of goods if you break it out and then you're going to have a line item with other cost of goods you're going to have break out your salaries and your marketing and you may just have another line item that says other fixed costs you're not going to have to keep track of your licenses and your softwares and your and your uh telephone providers and your cable providers and your internet providers, they are not going to change much. So just aggregate them all. Now, if that number changes dramatically, yeah, you're going to have to dig in. And then thank goodness you have 50 other line items you can look for. But typically they'll just vary a little bit over month to month. And it's important that you start looking and lining up these numbers, these simplified numbers month over month, because you're going to watch those drivers and then you're going to see if there's any other anomalies. So the fourth part I'm going to talk about is the capital and the non recurring expenses the non cash expenses. So we've talked about revenue cost of goods. We've talked about your gross profit and then your fixed costs below the operating line, below the operating line. These costs have to do with how you capitalize the company. So if you borrow a lot of money, you're going to pay a lot of interest. The operations of your business is not going to be affected by the interest, just the net profit. And if your net profit is lower, then obviously you're going to pay lower taxes. If you have a big capital investment in equipment, you're going to have a lot of depreciation. That's a non-cash expense that also is going to impact your taxable your net income but not your operating profit so these numbers below the operating line are reflect how you've capitalized the company they have nothing to do with how the business is being is is being operated and this is typically described as EBITDA a lot of times you'll hear EBITDA and what that does is it takes a it takes, it tries to compare that operating, the money that the company generates through its operations and separate out different capital structures. So EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. Okay, so if you are an owner managed business, you probably are not highly leveraged. You probably are not very aggressive on your depreciation. You may not have bought another company, you may not have amortization, and you're, you're probably paying taxes. Whereas if you're 
if you're comparing your company to a highly leveraged company that's owned by a private uh, by a private equity group, they probably have leveraged it up. They're accelerating depreciation. If they purchase it, they have huge amortization. So the net income numbers are going to be very different. But EBITDA will equalize that operating profit. And that's what we look at. The operating profit is what we look at when we when we sell our business, when we ask investors for additional dollars, it's a key indicator of how the business is doing. And in the tech world, y'all have very high margins there, and which is why your multiples are so good because there's very good sustainability of your income. It's very predictable if you have a subscription model. So this is a very important number to be watching. So understanding your capital and your non-recurring expenses, those operating, and you may have these, write them down if you have them, interest payments, if you have seller or owner notes, if, if instead of going to the bank, you lent yourself money, those notes should be written down and you should be paying yourself interest just like you would the bank, although you might pay yourself a little more than the bank. Um, taxes are going to vary based on your bottom line, not your operating line. Depreciation and amortization we've already discussed, and then any non-recurring expenses. So let's say you bought your um, you bought a competitor, and you spend a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees and other things. That would be a non-recurring expense. That would be below the line because it doesn't impact your operations. So here we are with our. We've now got our numbers all packed away in a 10 line item or a 15 line item, simplified financial statement. Now we use that financial statement to calculate our customer's profitability. How do we become more profitable? We make sure that we're charging our customers the right price and that we are monitoring our expenses to keep them in line with our business model. So this is, one of the main reasons for breaking out these numbers as I have described. We look at our variable costs, we look at our revenues and our COGS, marketing capital costs, and who's the most profitable customer. Now, this is my favorite graph, and this always surprises people. This is called a whale graph, and it is a description of most companies' client base. Now, obviously, if you sell one product and it's all sold for the same price, this won't impact you. But if you're selling a product to different customers, this is the norm. And the, the red dots are each customer. There are 20 customers here represented. So the red dots are each customer. Uh, the blue dots are each customer. And the red dots are cumulative. So you can see the first four customers of this business, of an average business, are not profitable. And the next eight or nine are just break even. And it's not until you five or six customers that are profitable. So if you see that red tail up there, it looks like the company is doing great. If you looked at their monthly financials, you'd be like, hey, they made a lot of money. But then when you dive down into the profitability, how profitable are each of their clients, you see that only five of them were actually profitable. Now they made a good profit, but think about think about how much more they could make if they priced their product right or looked at those variable and those fixed costs. Now the driver here is really that gross margin. So you can see in my example here, I have a gross margin of 38%, which is not bad for a, 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 a most companies. It would be a, a above average gross margin. So you're going to want to look at your customer and then you're going to want to look at how much revenue did I get from that customer and what were my gross, what were my cost of sales? And you're going to go and look at those variable costs and allocate them for each customer, the commissions, the labor hours. And yes, this takes some time, which is why you're separating out those various, those various line items that are drivers. You want to know what those drivers are for each customer. And then you're gonna look at each customer against the average. So is this customer profitable? The gross margin was 45%, that's above 38%. Yes, they made 
not just the 38% margin, but they made an additional $25,000. Customer B, their margin was their gross margin was 15%. What happened? I mean, maybe there was some um, there were some change orders that weren't properly priced, or the consultant spent too long on the project and wasn't able to wrap. The, you know, it was priced as a 10-hour job and it took 15. I see that kind of bracket creep all the time, and so that was actually not profitable. Now, is that another customer that you want to have again? How do you make sure that you don't have that problem again? And then customer C here is at 38%, right on the break even. You saw in the whale graph, 50% of your customers are really at break even, which is a scary thought. You don't need to practice your business. You want to do it and be profitable. So other profitability metrics that most companies look at is you know revenue per employee, number of visits like the doctor per day, um, number of units sold in a time frame. If you're selling widgets, you know you probably are selling thousands of them. Um, sales per square foot, year over year, same same store sales. There are lots of different indices for lots of different um, industries, but try to find a metric that works with your company and tie it to your revenue. So you can start looking at average revenue and then you then you'll know the profitability of your company and it will not look like a whale. Hopefully it'll be above the line and, you know, getting air. So we don't have time for Q of A, so I'm just going to go right into wrap up. And what I'm talking about here is really the tip of the iceberg uh, in that it takes a lot of time to really spend figure out what those variable and fixed costs are, separate them out, figure out what revenue line items you want to watch and narrow down the drivers. We don't need 50 line items. We want the very important ones. So it takes a couple of months, you know, or a couple of quarters to tweak those numbers. And you want to look at them month over month or quarter over quarter till you really feel like you understand the drivers and that you can see marketing spend reflected in revenue. And you can see margins improve as revenue goes up and you're able to keep your cost of goods steady, you're going to see improving gross margins. And every time you improve your gross margin, it falls right to the bottom line because those fixed costs are fixed. Really magic. I get so excited. Okay, so we talked about these five measures. And... Um, when I'm talking about financial statements today, we really focused on the income statement, but there are all kinds of implications for the other financials that you have to work with that are aligned with your income statement, your balance sheet. You want to do budgets. You want to be. You want to be. Um, you want to be specific, and you want to be sure of the budgets that you're setting. You want to set budgets that you can meet. You want to scale your company. You're going to try to set a budget that's a stretch and you want to find ways. You want to be intentional and find ways to be able to hit those budgets. Dashboards and ratios are things that you're going to want to develop so you can continue to watch and maintain profitable operations. Now, these are things that we do in the Business Owners MBA and we have great results. So I would love to talk to you if you want to learn more about this. And if you'd like me to send you the um, completed, if you'd like me to send you the completed spreadsheet with the, what we showed you today, I'm happy to do so. Just shoot me an email and I'll get that to you as well. I hope you've learned something today and I've enjoyed speaking with you. Deb Purvin with the Business Owners MBA. Uh, that is my uh, URL, Business Owners MBA. Thank you and enjoy the rest of Women International Day. Thanks.